Hello and welcome to the Aston Villa Fan Show, the episode where you get to set the agenda and ask us questions, share your thoughts on all things Aston Villa. This is basically a phone-in style show, isn't it? But people are going to come on to the podcast and chat with myself and John Townley. It's similar to the Q&As we do, obviously, that we'll go down various tangents where we get to speak back and forth with the person rather than just uh, reading a tweet. So this should be, uh, hopefully, the start of a series that we do every couple of weeks maybe on the channel if you want to get involved after having watched this episode if you think i want to go on there and share my views uh, all the information you need will be in the description down below on youtube or on the various podcast apps if you scroll down uh, there'll be an email address which is my email uh, if you want to get in touch to say i'm interested let me know And when we do this again in two three weeks we'll uh, we'll send you an email back and say we're doing another show come and come and have your say so john let's get underway with the first caller and uh fingers crossed this actually works because we've done this before we're, we're winging it a little bit so uh yeah over to our first caller who is ollie ollie thank you for joining us how are you mate hi i'm doing well thank you how are you yeah really good john how are you by the way we've not really had much of a chat yet you okay <laughs> no i'm good thank you yeah nice to get some um well villa fans hopefully supporters of the crown Root podcast as well on the on the show to give their opinions we haven't really? done this before so this could go uh any any which way but yeah nice to see you Ollie as well ollie are you here with a question a comment a thought what do you want to share with us i, w- I was thinking i'm i moved out from birmingham to the united states and i was just thinking how much upside potential there is to get aston villa as a brand over to the US and so I I was thinking how cool that would be because where I am everyone's a Tottenham fan for some reason it's not even Man City it's not Man U it's just Tottenham everywhere the Premier League is getting so widespread over here I think it would be just awesome if Aston Villa can take this opportunity as it's spreading so quickly and I think getting this Adidas uh, kit sponsor kit manufacturer through would be amazing because Mm. You know, you you walk into the shops here and you see like Newcastle and seeing Aston Villa on that rack would would be good for the brand. And and so I'm really hoping they can tap into this huge, like expanding market yeah. over here. Yeah. So I, I think you've raised some really good points, Ollie. I mean, I was out in America for about about two weeks for the Premier League Summer Series and it blew me away the amount of support that like Brighton had for example like not just Brighton of course but that was kind of like a point of well if Brighton have got this amount of fans and you know what what will Villa have and obviously there's a huge fan huge fan base in uh, for Villa but then Chelsea is like another level Tottenham as you say Oli is there as well I think to be honest the Premier League has probably boomed at the right time for Tottenham because when it was a Villa Everton Tottenham in like I don't know 2010 should we say um obviously Tottenham went beyond and have been in the Champions League for many years since then. I think that's probably coincided with it. I don't know if it's a thing of American fans thinking, oh, I don't want to support the same club as everyone else, be it Chelsea, Man United, Liverpool at that point. And then it was then Tottenham or maybe Man City as well. Um, I think that may be, you know, potentially uh, a point. And I think Wes Eden's, obviously he knows that market very well, being um, invested in the sports industry in America. Chris Heck, obviously joining the club as well. I don't think it's, kind of a coincidence that they're both from America. Do you know what I mean? Edens would have appointed him knowing that that's a huge market that Villa can go into and obviously something that Heck did well um, at the 76ers in Philadelphia. So um, I think you're some really good points. And Villa right now, they have the opportunity to be that kind of the next club. I know that, um, you know, everyone here is like the big six and I think Sky Bet have now changed it to big seven on their um, websites and it's like Newcastle and now that team but Villa want it to be like a great eight that's their thing so if we can basically add on to become the eighth team then in America yeah you're right I think there's a huge opportunity um, and there is already you know a big fan base over there there's we've Dan will say like we've already had loads of comments and stuff for people who want to come on like yourself mm-hmm. who are actually living in America yeah. Um, but yeah it's a huge market as you're saying the Adidas deal especially will go some way to um, helping that. Ollie, how much importance do you think is put on the Champions League for Villa? Would that, well, that seems an obvious point because it's such a prestigious competition, but would that elevate the, the kind of market in America because it's so, well, they're one of the clubs that are in there with Barcelona and Real Madrid and that kind of thing? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, the Champions League, even for people who don't necessarily tune into the Premier League, but they tune into La Liga and the Bundesliga, I think the Champions League is kind of where they all intersect. And so mm. I think even just getting Villa's name in and if we can get the timing with getting Aston Villa as part of like Adidas, um, 
having all that happen at the same time, I think would really, really go a long way. Um, just in, in terms of especially profit and sustainability as well, I think, you know, if we can get into the Champions League, I think you guys might have done a podcast at some point on how the the pure like money amount of being in the Champions League isn't necessarily as much as you would expect. But then all of the other things that come with it would would be amazing. And then, you know, I think... I think the Champions League would be great just as a fan as well <laughs> to, you know, having Real Madrid come to Villa Park would be something else. So. Oh, that's mad, isn't it? I'd love that. No, I think you've hit a good point there as well, Ollie, because it is, as you say, it's the Champions League. It's the eyes that are on the Champions League. Like worldwide, the Champions League's just huge. Like, I don't know, me going, I don't travel often. So this season has been like a big thing for me. Uh, so going to like Warsaw, for example, in Poland, Champions League nights over there were huge, probably because their league is, uh, well, it's quite small compared to obviously like the, the top five leagues and maybe in the top seven in Europe. Um, but yeah, it's the eyes that are on the Champions League that allows for that revenue in terms of commercial uh, sponsorships and things like Adidas will obviously help that. Um, but yeah, Villa being on the main stage, that's the opportunity for them to make more money, which is, of course, the uh, what will take the club forward. I also think even little things like I think for the first half of the season, we obviously were completely, you know, doing amazingly and not that we aren't now, but, you know, the first half of this season is some of the best results we've seen in my lifetime for sure. Um, and even just the fact that was so unexpected from the start of the season started to kind of make waves over here. You know, people would come up to me like friends knowing I'm a Villa fan but knowing nothing about the Premier League going I've heard that you're like Aston FC or whatever like they're doing quite well aren't they um <laughs> Aston FC so you know <laughs> thank you very much Ollie for being our first ever caller on the the AVFC football what everyone calling this fan phoning thing uh thank you for getting involved mate our first caller John how was that that was all right wasn't it went that went better than we thought <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we thought before Dan um <laughs> Yeah, Ollie spoke really well and he raised some good points, stuff that we've uh, spoken about, you know, in a small capacity, I suppose. But this is why the fan uh, phone is good because it kind of allows us to elaborate on subjects that we uh, don't know if fans will be um, caring about. But clearly Ollie was and the rest of the USA audience. That's, um, yeah, really good points raised by him. Our next caller is Ula from Sweden. Hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. Uh, how are you, sir? Are you okay? I'm very good, and thanks for calling me, sir. It makes me feel almost as old as Matt Kendrick when you say that. So, <laughs> What do you want to share with us? A question, a comment, a thought? What have you got? I read something that John wrote uh, about the international expansion, and um, yeah. it was a piece written about uh, the clubs that we're already working with, and of course that's a good way to uh, attract more people. But I wanted to discuss other ways that we might or might not know uh, that Villa wants to expand their fan base. So I looked up a couple of stats that I found on FootGoal regarding sort of followers that all of the different Premier League sites have on the different social media. And Villa is in eighth place with a combined 15.6 million followers across their platforms. Man United, no surprise, is number one with 216 million. And Tottenham in sixth place have 94. So the drop off between Tottenham at 94 to Villa at 15.6 is huge. Mm, yeah. So clearly, we all know that football nowadays is business and we need to increase the revenue. And of course, the way we're doing in the league and hopefully getting into Champions League will help with that. But do we know any other ways that the club is trying to expand their reach globally? Has there been anything said about it? And if not, what would you guys do in order to expand the reach? This is kind of Chris Heck's job, um, maybe half and half. The first half is to obviously make sure Aston Villa as a, as a football club in terms of business is going well, but they need to be a global brand and having um, Nassif Suarez, the richest man in Egypt, one of the most um, you know, richest people in Africa. And then Wes Eden as well, someone who knows the sports market as well as anybody in the Premier League. I think you can ask for better owners to help Villa. I, I think it's difficult because Villa have been, you know, we, we've struggled, haven't we really? Mm. Even, 12 months ago, we were, well, not 12, 14 months ago, we were on the cusp of relegation under Steven Gerrard. So we haven't been very successful. We've been in the championship, obviously, for quite um, a period of time as well, what, three years. And as we said to Wally, it was almost since Villa kind of fell out of Europe and kind of descended from there 
that is almost exactly when football has started to boom like globally in terms of social networks, etc. And I think it's yeah. you write really good points, Ula, because this you must want to write like um a thesis on it because there's, there's so much to go at. And as I say, this is now Chris Heck's role. Um, I don't have the answer specifically. I'm sure Dan does. Um, <laughs> but it is, it is really interesting because Villa have to now be, as, as I said before, a part of the great eight because the top six are here to stay. They're, they're not going anywhere. If you, you know, if you look at Tottenham in terms of their revenue, the money they're making, the stadium that they now have, they've now cemented themselves as one of the um, most attractive clubs in England for players, for fans, for international fans, that is somewhere that Villa need to try and get to. And it's much difficult, much more difficult, sorry, because Tottenham are based in London. They've had the Champions League for the last few years. They've had players like Harry Kane. They're like an international brand. Villa need to get towards that. I don't think there's like any easy way of doing it, but on-pitch performance is obviously going to help. As we said, being in the Champions League, even the Europa League, being in Europe for a sustained period of time, that's, um, you know, everyone's eyes are on you then. Mm. And being in the Premier League helps, but you need to be successful. You know, no one is looking at Crystal Palace and um, other teams towards the uh, bottom of the table, I suppose, where Villa were even before they were relegated. And there's so many teams that you'd pick otherwise than Villa. Why would it be Villa? It would almost be like a random selection apart from maybe you like the colour of the kit. So now Villa need to be successful. Um, yeah. And that will help attract more eyes, which brings in more money, which makes it more... Um, sustainable going forward as I say Tottenham is the prime example and I'm probably going to go on, for, on a tangent here rather than what you've asked about but the concept of getting new fans like what does that actually mean it's two things isn't it it's people that currently don't support Aston Villa and how do you hook them into the sport of football to begin with and get them to support your club is is an interesting uh, concept or it's cultivating the next generation along isn't it like I've got a son he's one it's gonna be a long time before he starts contributing you know, some money towards this football yeah. club isn't it so how do you kind of grow that fan base it almost goes against everything about the traditional oh you've got to live around Villa Park you've got to go to every game to be a proper fan and all this stuff we actually need to branch out to people who maybe have never been to Villa game before and get them buying shirts and stuff and how you do that I don't quite know, but you mentioned Spurs, John. I saw a picture at the weekend of a lot of uh, Asian supporters at the stadium for Son. You almost need yep. that kind of global brand recognition mm. of they're there for an individual player or a moment like you've won a trophy or something. They kind of jump on the bandwagon, for want of a better phrase. That's how you're going to generate more fans because you've got the catchment area of Villa Park and the surrounding areas of, of 40,000. But to get new people involved kind of goes against that traditional idea of you have to branch out at some point and you can't just rely on my son and his son because that's going to take 40, 50 years for them to come through. You need to get new people and that idea of supporting a new club if you've not been around before, it's this kind of tourist idea, isn't it, that people don't like. But at some point, you have to branch out of your confinements of your, your area, I suppose. Well, that, and I think also there's something to go so about saying creating the ambassador. So, I mean, in, in Sweden, for example, we always talk about Melberg, you know, mm. And he was back at Villa Park last year, and he, he's the coach for the team that my uh, my son plays for, sort of youth soccer for the club where he's at. So, but, you know, it would be great if you could start using these ambassadors. And I also want to give a shout out to all the local Villa fan clubs. I mean, we have one in Sweden. It's 724 members this year. It's up 27% versus last year when it was 569. So but it's still only 700 people. But out of mm. those 700, about 60 to 80 travel to Villa Park every year together yeah, to I've see a game. And that's how you also create the community. And, mm. you know, there's always during the games on Facebook, you know, we write comments and how about the referee can't see, uh, you know, drawing the line on, on Bailey's foot instead of, <laughs> of uh, someone's other parts of the body. So, you know, it's it's all fun and banter when it comes to that stuff. And I think those ambassadors, whether it's old players or, or just the local communities, I think they can also do quite a lot uh, in order to expand in, in every part of the world. Yeah, I think there probably is more that Villa could do or can do there. And it's interesting you mentioned that as well, because like pre-season thing, I think that's important. I don't know where Villa will be going uh, this summer, but when they went to Florida, there was loads of South American fans and they all wanted yeah. to see Emmy Martinez and Emmy Buendia mm. and they were yeah, yeah. weeds. And it kind of shocked me. I was like, oh yeah, of course. Like, this Having a World Cup winner probably yeah. does help, doesn't it? Yeah, it's not literally yeah. their part of the world, but you know, around there, there's like a huge um, you know, base of those supporters, you know, South American um, yeah. people. So um, yeah, you kind of, we need to open our eyes up. Not you, uh, Ula, because you're not uh, from Birmingham, but we need to open our eyes, and I think that happens with the club as well. 
And as I say, I think Chris Heck coming aboard, you know, whatever ideas he has, there'll be better ideas than what we would have. I'm pretty sure, you know, I, I know he's. Oh, no, don't sell yourself short now, John. <laughs> I, know, well, I know he's cutting the fire and stuff recently, but it, it's he's having that um kind of that diversity of ideas, right? That that's exactly what it is, mm. and that's and that's um yeah something that will take a vilify. It just needs to happen now. Um, and again, sorry, we don't exactly have the answers, but uh, it's definitely <laughs> something that if we ever get the chance to speak to these people, no, but it's um, it uh, is important, and I you yeah. know it'd be I think the club talked about the three different so like internal, local, and global, or yeah, yeah. something to that effect. And it would be super interesting to hear what they want to do. I mean, there's some Spanish clubs, they do soccer schools in in Sweden, for example. And I Mm -hmm. think, I mean, for me, that could also be a way of of just getting some affinity, even though I don't live in Birmingham. I mean, it would be quite cool to do something like that and then try to use that to to sort of at least promote it, even though it's, it's a small thing. It doesn't have to cost that much either. It's almost like the inner city academy that that uh, bailey visited you know and mm-hmm. and trying to do something like that to to also raise the profile of of the club yeah thank you very much for your call yeah. Ola. uh we'll move on to our, our next one thank you very much next right. up is right. pete pete how are you mate oh, pete, sorry. i'm good yeah i'm all right thanks yeah what do you want to share with us this evening uh, my original point i'll come on to in a bit but what Ola just said there's really quite interesting look i lived abroad you can see i've got uh, mm-hmm. final charter because we won the european cup in the cow which is the final stadium that's one of the reasons i was drawn to following final to still follow them some of the points he made there are really interesting it happens organically people make associations themselves i'm sure we've mm-hmm. got fans in australia because of mark bosnich we've got um we've got fans in holland because of luke nillis and george boateng the things that people need to do to develop that there's kind of the root thing is there the connections are there there might be spanish people there watching villa because of power Torres, you know there's a big um, irish contingent isn't there from the from yeah, the Irish, a lot of irish right, players. Right. Yeah. yeah yeah exactly and and a part one of the one of the things i think from what he was talking about one of the things that will help build that is what you're doing because nowadays there's like you know we've got the internet i lived in the netherlands before the internet um, people can now interact with people all across the world on their common interests. You know what I mean? So your yeah. podcast, unbeknownst to you, might, whilst it might not be in your mind, is part of the, the vein of connections that can help yeah, build yeah. an international brand. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so carry on. Just we, carry we on. We need to game here, Dan. I feel a bit of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> the, th- the point I wanted to make was, like, I've been watching the Villa since 75. I think the first game I watched was the League Cup final in 1975. And in that time, we've had three managers that have been successful. We've got Martin O'Neill, we've got um, Ron Saunders and Brian Little. Mm-hmm. And all three of them had time to build their own team that would play according to the way that they wanted to see football played. Mm. Brian Little, to some degree, built on the model that Ron Saunders had built. Um, but the previous three have all been scuppered by a certain chairman that we had in sort of background staff. And I kind of just want to... So look, what I see happening at Villa now is just the best I've ever seen because we've got a we've got a manager who's above those guys. He's probably akin to Ron Saunders, but he's an absolute genius football wise. Mm-hmm. Uh, genius is people who see deeply and understand to the level he does. Generally, don't get understood up front. The 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 effect of what they apply comes out, and then people start to believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and we we have a backroom staff now. It seems to me that the whole club as an enterprise. That's a group of people are all sort of married into the same idea and pulling in the same direction. Um, so we've had a bit of a blip in, you know, in uh, over Christmas and whatever since since beating Arsenal. But it's not a time to panic because no. it, it, it took those three guys a few years to find success. Ron Saunders took over in 74. He won a couple of League Cups and then he won the... You know, just by doing his thing, he won won the championship, the old division one, and then the European Cup. Brian Little had success after a couple of years. Martin O'Neill would have had some success, didn't win silverware, but we were top four. We were in Europe, we were competing in semi-finals, and you know, given another two or three years, who knows what he would have achieved, you know. So um mm-hmm. yeah, that's how I see the villa at the moment. I think we we're in a good place. Give it two or three years and we're right. We're right in there with the top six. It's just the financial side of it that yeah needs is the that's the main barrier. 
I get the idea that it takes several years really to build exactly what you want as a manager to instill a philosophy and all those kind of things. It's almost like Emery's way ahead of schedule, isn't it? I think when he was appointed yeah. last year, if anyone said you'll get to Europe, he'd have gone, oh, don't be silly. Like getting top off would have been a good achievement last year. So to get to Europe and this year surpass that so far and be up and around top four and talk a title races and whatnot before Christmas is, is way ahead of schedule. The second thing I enjoy is that obviously me and John are of a different generation to yourself. I feel like John's almost a different generation to me and it's only what, five years. <laughs> difference between us but you know John you've known the best days at the back end of the O'Neill era when you were a kid that's my best time as well Dean Smith promotion from the championship which yes a good achievement but we always say we shouldn't have been in the championship in the first place I don't want to be too too happy about that getting out of a division you should never have been in so when someone of your age I'd say your age as if you're ancient I don't mean that Uh, but you know for somebody who started watching Villa in the 70s for you to say that this is the best time for Aston Villa as well kind of vindicates when we say it because I always feel like when we say it people go well they're young they didn't see that win the win the league in the 80s and all that kind of stuff didn't see the success of the 90s so when somebody from your era will say that this is the best time as well it makes me think yeah it is that good because it guys like you've seen us win trophies and if you think this is better than that how special could this be exactly exactly the point yeah when I look at the um the cohesion behind the scenes I've not seen that before uh, I think the key point is that that you've mentioned there Pete as well is you know United's a genius, we know all of that. And I feel like most, you know, football fans who have switched on would understand that as well before he even came to Villa. But the key difference, as you mentioned there, is the backroom team that he's got. He didn't have that at Arsenal. He had it to an extent at PSG and he succeeded at PSG. He succeeded at Sevilla, he succeeded at Valencia. There's a common trend here. If you give him what he wants, or at least part of it, he's going to succeed. What he's done with Villa, it's remarkable. Like I, we, we are, We're never given enough credit to what we deserve, even now with all the injuries we've had. Mm. Uh, it's it, it, it's shocking that we don't get the attention that we deserve or that Emery deserves specifically. Um, and it's credit to people like Damian Vidigani and Monchi that they're doing well too. But these are all guys that Emery wanted. And the Seth just said, yeah, you, you have the keys. You run the football side with those guys. Um, and there's a business side as well. It's almost like two different entities at the moment with Villa, which, you know, maybe that's an issue moving forward. When Emery goes, what happens then? But while we have him, while we have him, sorry, and hopefully that's for a long time, you are right. And you've said before, Dan, surely success comes after this. If it doesn't, then what do we do? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, this is, if this doesn't work, it'll never work. If this, is, if this is the best manager, you know, Pete's seen, and you've, and you've named some top managers there yourself, I'm sitting up thinking, okay, well, I know that this is, this should be the good times for Villa fans now. Mm. Um, and again, with the owners we have, hopefully that's a continuation for years to come. But under Emery specifically, and the people that he's surrounded by, you're right, I, you know, this can't fail, surely. Uh, right, Pete, thank you very much for your call. We'll move on Cheers, to our Pete. next one. Thank you very much. Cheers. Mike, you're our fourth caller on the Aston Villa fan phone in. You've got a microphone as well. Here we go. Love this. Love this. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I'm good. How are you guys? Yeah, excellent. Where are you from? Uh, you I'm from the States. I'm over in Pittsburgh. So, okay. um, Lovely. yeah, real international flair to this episode, isn't there? Um, yeah, it really is. I wasn't expecting this, but yeah, really interesting. <laughs> what, what, what's, your, what's your point? What's your question? So I got a short story and then we'll follow it up with a question. So okay. um, I just started supporting Villa six, seven years ago. I have no connection to the UK at all. Basically, I have a podcast where I cover our local team, the Riverhounds, and I do it with my brother, who has been sort of a lifelong Liverpool fan. And so about six, seven years ago, he was like, you got it. You got to pick a, a, an EPL team. You have to. And so at first I was like, oh, I'll just take Arsenal. Sure. Like, give me Arsenal. And and really happy. I, I went back on that like the following week. I was like, I don't want to do that. That's terrible. <laughs> so I started doing my homework. I start looking around and I'm like, OK, well, you know, Villa recently promoted. You got this Grealish guy who's a local guy. You're, you got Dino, who's a local guy. If you weren't far removed from having Acorns as your sponsor, which made me think of like UNICEF with Barcelona, like back in the heyday. I'm like, this is a club that's like headed in the right direction. This feels right. So I said, I'm going to do Aston Villa. And everyone I know is like, no, 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 no. Come on. They just, they just got promoted. Like, what are the, what are the odds? And I said, no, no, no. And as I'm watching games, matches, sorry, I realize I'm, I'm enjoying the, uh, the, there was almost no pressure at that point. As long as we weren't going down, it didn't matter who we were facing. It was just, there's a chance we could, we can take some points. And if we don't, like no one's really expecting us to, no big deal. I'm talking to my brother who is a Liverpool fan. And after every single game, he's a nervous wreck, regardless of how well they played, because I realized he was more afraid of them dropping points every time they step on the field 
from the beginning of the season because he just assumes they're going to be in a title race. So he's a nervous wreck the entire game. And I'm going into every game going, this is going to be great. You know, we drop what, seven goals on Liverpool during that one season. So my question to you is now that Villa are in the top four and we're talking about title chances, yeah. as you guys watch a match, are you of the mindset that you're a, you go into every game afraid that we're going to drop points <laughs> or are you more excited at the prospect of winning? Oh, that's a great question. I think um, me and John are on, the, on both sides of the corner. Now. I think um, you were scared. <laughs> yeah, I'm always very scared. <laughs> I was saying this, if you ask anyone, or if, not that you would, but all of the kind of reporters that cover Villa as well, none, no one wants to sit next to me in the press box because I'm, I'm, I'm like a box of frogs, man. I'm, I shouldn't be because I'm working. Um, but I think you are right. I said this to my dad actually the other day, so it's it's interesting that you bring it up, Mike. But you know, I, I mentioned that we're, I think if I was covering Villa or being as a fan, if we were like sort of mid-table, because we had a couple of seasons in mid-table, you know, as you mentioned, pressure pressures off in most games. You, obviously, you want to win the games that you're supposed to win, but every other game felt like a bit of a free hit if we were going to Chelsea or going to Liverpool, playing them at home even. But now you're right. It feels like, I mean, I mentioned in the podcast we just did, we have 13 cup finals, so that, there's the pressure. <laughs> um and yeah, I am. I always kind of come at it from a kind of more. I'm anxious and I have anxiety about this match, which I don't want to be the case because I want to enjoy myself. Um, but I get the kind of enjoyment after we win because throughout the game, it's not nice to uh, every loose ball in that Fulham game. I was thinking, oh, yeah. <laughs> which if you're watching on TV, probably isn't even like, yeah, you wouldn't even right? notice. Yeah, yeah, probably not. But um, that's just me. I think I'm, we're probably cut from the same cloth, Mike. But uh, Dan, I don't know how you can kind of sit there and well <laughs> during the games. Once, once I'm like, especially if I'm like, if it's a home game, I'm there. Once it kicks off, and it's like, yeah, okay, like this is it now. Like this is this is the next <laughs> ninety minutes. It's now or never. And in that like one hour of that game, I do have that kind of feeling of, especially for Man United, the most re- the most recent home game I was at. It was like, oh, okay, if we lose, this is bad. And I, I felt that kind of energy of this is a serious thing. But when yeah. we do the podcast and we're not like on the game day situation, we're like looking ahead. We'll go, oh, there's the next six fixtures, and I'm going, oh, 15 points, 20 points. Oh, I can see us winning there, and John will be, they're all really tough games, mate. And I'm like, ah, come <laughs> on, like, be excited about it. There's opportunities to go and yeah. do something. That's how I feel about it. But during the games, especially as they start to go on, I do share that kind of sense of dread of if we mess this up it's a bad thing but i also feel like every so often we need to take that step back and realize what this season yeah, yeah. is and how good we're doing like almost losing the enjoyment of being in a top four race by being super stressed out about every game is probably not the great greatest way to go about it but that's football isn't it I, 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 I feel similar to how we were in that promotion season um in a weird way it's like a fear of not wanting to be hurt you know you don't want to get to yeah, Wembley and have of, that experience yeah. again you don't want to get to the palace game and have an experience of not getting champions league and man united do it instead so every game and every moment you just kind of mm. you get worked up about um but it shouldn't be the case i need to take some i think i said to you dan i need to take some sedatives <laughs> after that <laughs> game. I think I, I think I to that. <laughs> thank you very much for your question and your it's story fine. uh greatly appreciated we'll move on to our next caller Thanks, guys. Toby, I recognise that when you first joined the call, you weren't wearing a Villa shirt. You are now. Now I am, yeah. Get, now I am. I've had some big shirt. guns on. How's your, how's your day been? Yeah, good. 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 Yeah, good. Thank, Thank you. you for asking. Uh, what do you want yeah. to talk about? Well, I just kind of wanted to have some like hopeful hopeful thoughts and you know, put some good positive air and you know, talk into the air. So if, if it is all the stars are to align and we do get that magical Champions League spot, who who we who do you really think we need? Where do we need to sort of strengthen our squad, and what what sort of players do you reckon we we'd be looking at? Because I think for me at the moment, obviously, I think we've got good depth. Obviously, yeah. apart from our injuries, I'm really happy with the depth of the squad. So I was just wondering, kind of like what sort of players you'd be kind of expecting to come in to really deepen our squad for those Champions League games. Firstly, it's going to be an interesting summer because of whether we get Champions League or not. We need to obviously um, be in a position where we can spend money and to what extent Villa will release their accounts next month, I believe. So that will be um, interesting to kind of look at and that won't tell us the full picture of exactly what's going to happen. So in terms of budgets and stuff, we don't know. And to be honest, I don't think Villa know exactly yet in terms of it will depend on if we get Champions League, uh, most likely. So... I think still, you know, you can talk about uh, positions though. And I think right back is probably one area. I think everyone would say that. Emery has said himself that um, he kind of sees Concer and Cash as basically two different options. They're both right backs. Uh, Well, Concer's a centre-back, but you get my point. He wants to play Concer if it's like a game where Villa need to be more defensive, I suppose. And then Cash, if uh, he sees more of an opportunity for him to go forward. So I think 
either or position there in terms of will he bring in a right back who can do a defensive job or can he bring in a right back who can go attacking you know someone like a Frimpong I think would be an excellent signing but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interest in that player um I think he has a 30 million pound release clause in uh June or July so there'll be a a huge clamor for him I presume and then your other options I mentioned a right back do you remember I'm sure Dan will remember maybe in fact I forgot his name uh Lutz are all something Good Trouder, have I forgot his name? He's my guy. Um, he's more of like a defensive option that I like. And I'm, I think he was going to go to Barca or Dortmund, but the move fell through, I think. So he's clearly got a lot about him. It wasn't just me kind of making up uh, a name. I think that's one position. And then in other positions, I think you can look at well, who is available for Villa and in what kind of guys, you know, do we want a youngster to come in and maybe compete for um, position behind uh, Watkins like Tielemans has been doing? I think that's a really nice role there can a youngster come in and maybe add more depth there. I know we've got Rogers, but I don't think we can have enough really in terms of um, those positions because we've seen yeah. Buendia get injured this season. That can happen to any player. You know, any player can be missing for two, three months or whatever it may be. And it does have a big impact. And you're right, um, Toby, Champions League teams, you know, the squad, it needs to be, you know, you need to have a lot of players and there needs to be a lot of depth. Yeah. And I don't think you can have enough. So I honestly just think, where does Emery want to strengthen? He might even be another left back. You know, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with Luca Dean. As I say, it all depends on where Villa are financially in the summer. That will depend on different things. And where does Emery, you know, want to strengthen? And what is available ultimately? Because <clears throat> some players will come in and demand certain wages. Others will come in and, you know, be better alternatives. For example, uh, Lino Susu, uh, he's doing very well, very well at Plymouth. He may be ready to back up Alex Moreno if Luca Dean was to leave. Maybe Luca Dean stays and Susa goes on another loan or whatever it may be. So there's lots of things that will they'll be up and they'll, sorry that will be up in the air at the moment. So we'll have to wait and see. But I think there are probably a few positions where you can probably identify already and say that's where we need something extra. Strength in midfield as well. Kamara being out till September midfield, October yeah. Yeah, is, yeah. is something that needs needs sorting over the summer. Possibly if it, you know all these things are variables on if Douglas Louise was to leave, obviously you need a, a big sign in, in midfield to yeah. replace him. Something slightly left field for me, just to be slightly different, is centre back. And I only mean this in the sense that obviously Paul Torres is excellent and plays as we come to the same plays or he plays right back. You've got the situation with Tara Mings coming back, hopefully May, June, whenever that is, back in training and, and being available for next season. But that kind of cloud hanging over him of or what Tyron Mings comes back from injury, will he be the same player or not? Yeah. And the other two is Longley is obviously on loan, and I'm not sure would stick around. Diego Carlos, who, just from a financial point of view, that's a very expensive back line we'll have got with the likes of Dean, Carlos, Longley on loan. He's on several hundreds of thousands at Barcelona. So, you know, I don't mean strength and centre-back in the sense that we're not very good there, because Conza, Torres, Longley and Carlos are four very good centre-backs. Tyron Mings is a very good centre-back as well. But I just think if you're maybe having to tweak things from a financial point of view, trimming the wage but at, at the back and maybe getting similar quality players for much less wages is certainly something that would then help us improve the pitch elsewhere from a balance in the books scenario. I think that's an interesting one, the long glass situation, because it's a player or, you know, I'm sure Villa would like to have, but then is it needed because Mings is coming back financially, as you say, down with Carlos as well, is there a cheaper alternative? You know, is this another way that Villa can balance the books without selling one of the big players? All of those things will kind of come out, I suppose, in, you know, in the coming months, but, you know, mm. it'll be an interesting summer, whatever happens, I suppose, in the last, what, three months of the season. All right, Toby, thank you very much for your call. We'll, we'll yeah, move Toby. on. Dal. Thank Dal. you for waiting around. Sorry, it's been such a long time to get to you. How are you, mate? Everything well? That's all right. I'm good. How are you guys? Yeah, all good, Dal. Excellent. Uh, what's your comment or question that you want to share with I'm us? I'm not quite international, but I am from Wales, so that's kind of... Um, <laughs> I actually won the FPL league that last year, the Clown Blue one, and he sent me this poster. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> so my question is... Um, Obviously, everything's built around Unemory at the club, the sporting director, everything. He's got everything there. Are you worried that he could just go and take everything out, take everyone with him, and we'd be in a worse position than when he came? Mm, we get this question quite a lot, don't we, John? I will say, the Welsh accent saying Unemory is, is delicious. I, I love that. It sounds like rolls off the tongue in, in, in the Welsh accent. <laughs> but yeah, we get this question a lot, don't we? Because the whole club is built around him if he was to be pinched by Barcelona or Real Madrid or whoever, Bayern Munich, uh, possibly looking for a manager in the summer. Which I don't, I, don't think, I don't think these things will happen, but the scenario is there, right? They're big clubs, uh, massive institutions. If they come for someone like Emery, where does that leave Villa when everything is built around him? 
you do that because you want to give the guy the tools he needs to get your club success. But then you also have that risk of, well, if he does go, we lose our right-hand man, our assistant, the scouts, the technical director, everyone who we bought in for him, they're all going to want to leave as well. So it does kind of paint a pretty grim picture, I suppose, for what post Emery Villa might look like in terms of losing and having to replace all of that personnel. What I would say is I hope that's a long time away before we have to deal with that and it's off the back of Villa being successful with him. And if that was the case, that let's say Villa win three trophies under Emery in the next five or six years, you would like to think that his replacement and the staff that come with him are also of a, a good level to be able to fill his shoes, for want of a better phrase. Where I look at it is I think, well, Emery is come to the club he's settled in Birmingham which you know I know we joke about it sometimes but for um, some Spanish people that might not be their kind of ideal uh, destination to live the lives for the next five years or something Um, so I think if Emery you know he comes and he says to Monchi you know come here because I'm going to be here for a long time says the same thing to Dami and the same thing to the scouts they need reassurances that that is going to be the case because if Emery left in X amount of time that's a short period they'll say well why did you bring me here for it? Because they're all his, I don't want to say his friends, but they all get on well. They all have good working relationships, but they all they all know each other um, and they all respect each other as well. And I don't think it would be a wise move for Emery to then suddenly... And by the way, this isn't Emery. It's not his personality. It's the most, one of the most respectful people that I've ever met in terms of the football industry, like genuinely. For him to then kind of just say, all right, I'm off now and you guys will have to get jobs elsewhere because... X club isn't going to take you on as their technical director because they've already got one. It's a bit like, oh, okay. <laughs> and I know it's a bit cutthroat football, but I don't expect that from Emery mm-hmm. whatsoever. So I think that's one part of it that people probably don't look at. The other part of it would just be, well, as, as we've said before, um, he's getting lots of success at Villa at the moment. Why change that for a risk at another club when, I mean, he's not, you know, particularly old for a manager either. He could probably do this job for another 20 years. Like, does he have to suddenly jump ship to, to another club when he knows that if he wins trophies, if he gets top four with Villa consecutively, that sort of stuff, his stock's only going to increase. So, yeah, and my third point on that would be, I don't think he had anything else to prove to a club like Barcelona, Real Madrid, Atletico, though, all those clubs. I think if they wanted him, they would have gone for him by now because mm-hmm. I think I feel like it was only kind of the football fans in England who didn't really appreciate him. And everyone else kind of knew exactly what he is and people in Europe couldn't kind of sing his praises high enough. Um, and as well, he went to a club like, I say, a club like Villarreal, not to be disrespectful, but again, he probably could have gone somewhere better and bigger. He might have used that as a stepping stone, but I think Villa is now, he knows he can be sustainably good. Again, the financial side is something that he might have to manage. We may have to sell players. We don't know yet. Um, but if, it, if that is the case, well, then he's got Monchi, he's got Damian that he's going to be working with to improve his team. And again, this sort of stuff looks good in his CV, if, even if he has to kind of struggle with that stuff and he still has success. So for me, I don't see a way in which he suddenly thinks, oh, the grass is greener over there because I don't think that's how he operates. I think we've all said it before, there's certain managers who suit certain clubs um, and Emery is definitely one of them. So, John, that was the first ever edition of the Aston Villa Fan Show, the show where those guys got to set the agenda. We went down many different avenues there that when we sat down an hour ago, I didn't think we were going to be talking about some of the things we've spoken about. But that is the beauty of doing a show like that, and and that's what we really enjoyed. Yeah, it is nice to hear it from other people because it is, um, you know, I like your opinions, Dan, but... uh... Obviously, we speak to each other and not that it gets boring, hopefully not for the viewers uh, either, but it's nice to you say to get different uh, perspectives. That's the word that I've been looking for. Mm, yes, absolutely. And my face is like a red tomato, so it's time to call this show to an end, so I'm absolutely roasting. Uh, John, thanks for joining me. Thanks to everyone for uh, contributing to this show as well. Uh, very much appreciated. Without them, this show would literally not exist. So, uh, yeah, thank you <laughs> sure. for getting involved. If you enjoyed this one, let us know on YouTube. Scroll down to the comments and share your views. Uh, and if you'd like to get involved, please do email me. The information is in the description. Uh, if you listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating and a review. They're extremely helpful. We'll be back soon with another episode. There's loads of content coming up on Claret and Blue at the moment. So stay subscribed and we'll see you again very soon.